download our IELTS preparation app and access unlimited premium practice material for your exam. Part 1 Anna receives a phone call from her friend Peter. You'll hear an extract from their conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Hello. Hi, Anna. Look, I'm sorry to bother you so late. I just wanted to ask you a little favour. Oh, sure. Well, I'd like to help out. Anything you want. Look, I'm, um, I'm going to London for a week. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, I wish I could get away on holiday. Look, I, I got a problem, though. I, you know, I got some cats and, uh, I, I need a home for them. Oh, uh, well, the only thing is, how many of them are there? Well, there's only two. Oh, well, that's okay, then. I think I still have a box, but it's pretty worn out and a bit dirty. Not too nice, you know. Well, um, I think that'll be all right. I, I'm sure it'll be fine as long as you clean it up. I mean, you will have to clean it up because, uh, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't want to mention this earlier because perhaps, uh, but uh, one of them is pregnant, you see. One of the cats is pregnant and she's going to be delivering uh, pretty soon. Oh, no. I'm a little nervous about it now. I mean, uh... I don't know if I can cope with that. Of course you can. Look, I mean, they're okay. She looks after her babies. She had six the last time. You'll love them. Six? Wow. That's just a little too many. I mean, oh, I I don't think I could cope with that, I mean. And and how do I tell when they're due, you know, when, when they're going to be delivered? Very simple. You see, the mother starts spending more time in her box and starts meowing a lot. You will know that she's ready to have the babies. Well, what kind of food do I have to give them? Very simple. They don't need anything, and the mother nurses them for about five to six weeks. You just give the mother cat food and milk. Well, does it have to be hot? No, just fresh milk. Anyway, why do you keep them? I mean, don't they cause you an awful lot of work and trouble? Oh, no, they're so sweet. They're so beautiful. You're going to just love them when you see them. They're so nice. Uh, look, the mother also needs some fresh milk every day. Well, how often do I have to give her milk? Just two or three times a day. Well, here's an idea. Why don't you bring what they need? Then I'll just have... Then I won't have to worry about it. OK, I could do that. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Listen carefully to the following talk and choose the correct answer for each question. When the Europeans first came to the American continent more than 400 years ago, there were relatively few diseases and viruses on the new continent. During that time, however, plagues and diseases that killed thousands were floating around Europe. Eventually, some Europeans developed immunity to the unsanitary world of industrialization. When they came to the American continent, however, many of the Native Americans had never been exposed to these viruses and hence did not develop immunity to them. By sharing the same food and water sources, many Native Americans contracted the European diseases. At a time when medical vaccines were still in their early stages, this led to the tragic death of thousands. The Native Americans gradually developed immunity to these diseases and were able to interact with the new explorers and colonists. 
they traded everyday items with each other, which led to the hybridization of these two cultures. One enterprising European colonist had an interesting idea. Why not create a trading post where the two groups could sell their newly combined works of art? Eventually, a post was set up, and the distinctly American works became known throughout the country for their unique styles. The trading post continued for a couple more decades until it eventually faded away. The works of that time period can now be seen at the Smithsonian National Museum. Until very recently, some tribes were still making pieces of art and selling them in their local trading posts. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk given by Madeline. She is going to introduce the recreational facilities on campus and in town. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Madeline Stewart, and I'm here to tell you about the recreational facilities available on campus, and also to tell you something about what the town has to offer. You may already know that your student's union membership also includes membership of the sports union, which provides a range of sporting and recreational facilities on campus much the same as those in most British universities. The sports union has football, tennis, and cricket teams in local competitions. And really, most sports are catered for in some way on campus, even if they're just social matches. In the building itself, there are fitness classes and a full gym, including weights. The sports union can also provide cheap tickets to some major sporting events. And to keep you up to date with everything available, there's a weekly newsletter distributed around the campus. You should check this to find out the names and phone numbers of the contact people for each sport or activity you're interested in. Er, yes, did you have a question? Yes, uh, apart from what you've just said, does the sports union offer individual help in any of its activities, uh, for example, in getting fit and healthy? Yes, we do. The sports union has a fitness assessment clinic every Friday staffed by the resident sports trainer, who can provide advice on the best program for you and refer you to various charts. I'm sure you all realize that for any medical assessment or health problem, you should go to the university medical service. The sports trainer can also advise you on a suitable training program using the weights. And now on to Ashbury. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. And now on to Ashbury. For a town of its size, Ashbury has some unusually good leisure and sporting facilities, most of which are near the center of town 
and easily reached by bus from this campus. There's a new, well, almost new, Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's not quite in the central town area, but it's only a five-minute walk from the bus stop. Above the pool, there's a high-tech fitness center that any of you more serious fitness lovers would need to check out. Then, in the center of town, there's a sporting complex called the Anderson Center, which contains squash courts and facilities for a number of other indoor sports, such as basketball. And just around the corner from the Anderson Center, in the main street there, is an indoor bowling alley. All of these facilities are listed in the weekly newsletter, so I encourage you all to look through it and... The end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. In this section, you are going to hear a conversation. Before you listen, please look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. Welcome to the new term. Hope you've had a good time in your vacation. Maybe you're looking forward to writing your dissertation. Now, in this section, you have an opportunity to ask questions on writing the dissertation. Requirements, milestones, who to see when you're in need of help. It's very informal. It may be written on paper but it's nice to get it confirmed. So, anything you'd like to ask? Dr Eric, is there a fixed hand in date yet? Yes, I will confirm that that's June 13th. OK, Tammy? What about the word limit? Well, we try to be pretty flexible on this, but in broad terms, it's 15,000 to 20,000. Ah. And you can choose your topics. I still have no idea about it. Who... Well, you should see your course tutor to agree on your final title, and you should also be aware that there's a special programme running on research methods for anyone who wants some extra help on that. Can I just check the deadlines for everything? Yes, sure. Look, let me write it on the board when the different stages have to be completed. First of all, you've got to work on your basic bibliography, and that's due in to your course tutor by February 1st, which is just two weeks away so you'd better confirm it. Shall we have our own draft plan by then? No, your draft plan is due on February the 13th, which is two weeks later, so that should give you plenty of time. And when do we have to be doing the research? That's over a one-month period, essentially February to March. And the write-up? Well, you can't really start writing until you've got quite a bit of research done, so that's really March to May, with the hand-in on the 21st. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions. Any more questions? Well, sir, just some advice, really. It's about computers. Would you advise us to buy one? What can I say, Karen? It's a massive expense, but I really feel that it will be of great benefit. You can always look in the Student Union Fellows for second-hand ones. Yes? I've been looking at some of last year's dissertations. Is that a good idea, sir? I read... Well, 
I don't think you should read them in detail too early or you might end up taking more of their ideas than you realise. But yes, it really is the best guide you can have to the expectations of the of what's expected when you write a dissertation. Sorry, Tammy, I interrupted you. That's OK. It's just that they did a lot of research using questionnaires. Is that a good idea? I think questionnaires are very good at telling you how people feel in questionnaires. But to be frank, they tell you very little else. Avoid them. About interviews, is it OK if we interview you? The tutors? I don't see why not. They don't have any special contribution to make, but you can, if you want. There's a whole section on this issue in the research guide. I'm afraid it's slightly out of date and you're probably better talking to the tutors on the research methods course, but you might find it useful to start there. OK, thanks. OK, well, great. I hope that sorted a few things out. You can always come and see me or drop me a note if you've got any more queries. Fine. OK, thanks. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. We're going to hear a talk about some British customs. Listen to the talk and complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good morning. My name is Marsha Smith, a counsellor here at the Student Services section of the University, and this morning I'd like to talk to you about visiting a British home. This may help you to cope well with your study and social life in Britain. There is a commonly quoted saying in Britain, an Englishman's home is his castle, which sums up the importance we give to our own bit of private territory. If you are living in a British home, or are invited to visit or stay with someone, it is important to act thoughtfully. For example, be punctual for meals and, if you know you have to miss one, let your host know as soon as possible. Check whether it is convenient for others in the house when you wish to take a bath or wash and dry laundry. And unless your host employs someone to do the housework, you are expected to make your own bed and keep your room clean and tidy yourself. If you don't have a door key, Remember to make arrangements if you intend to be out late, and keep your hosts informed of your whereabouts so they don't worry. These suggestions apply whether you're a guest or a lodger, and will help the household to run smoothly. If you're staying as a guest of a British family, or even visiting for one meal, it is customary to take a small gift of flowers, chocolates, or something to drink. Don't spend too much, as this could embarrass your hosts. If you're staying for several days as a guest, it is usual to give a small present when you leave. Usually, you will get onto first-name terms with people you meet quite naturally and quickly. If you're unsure, continue to use their family name, surname and title until they ask you to use their first name. Older people, and those with whom you have a more formal relationship, may prefer to stick to surnames, for example, Dr. Smith or Mrs. Smith. If you're going to eat with British people or to stay with a British family, you may want to know if there are things that they normally do or don't do at the table. Rather than worry too much about rules, you may like to watch other people and copy what they do. It also helps to understand a few customs first. Both at home and in restaurants, people normally wait until everyone has got their food before they start eating. However, they will start before this if someone says, Please don't wait or don't let it get cold. When people have started 
They keep their cutlery, knives, forks, and spoons on the plate when they are not using them, and leave them on the plate when they finish the course. For each course, different cutlery is used. You may also notice that people don't usually spend much time at the table talking, drinking, and smoking. In fact, after dinner at home, it's fairly common for everyone to leave the table together and have coffee in the living room. If you are staying with a family or visiting informally, it's usual to offer to help with household chores. For example, clearing the table and washing up the dishes after a meal. Even men are expected to offer. They may not be accepted. At a more formal meal, however, the host won't normally expect guests to help with household chores. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.